and 16 principal leadership awards with matching grants to teachers and principal schools. To date, the foundation has awarded $11.6 million to Wisconsin educators, students, and schools. The Herb Cole Foundation Fellowship rewards teachers who have demonstrated superior ability to inspire love of learning in their students, motivated others, and provided meritorious service both inside and outside the classroom. The Leadership Award recognizes the importance of exceptional school leaders who help provide successful school environments for students and faculty members. Teachers and principals each receive $6,000 with their award, and an additional $6,000 matching award is provided to their school. The district is fortunate to have two teachers receiving awards this year, as well as one Leadership Award recipient. Ryan's here. Oh, there's Sid and us. They're here. Okay. Yeah. Just come up here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't order this weather. So. <laughs> okay, first we'll start with, how do you pronounce your last name? Sidorowitz. Sidorowitz. Nick has been with the Wisconsin Rapid School District since August 2008. Nick has worked as a social studies teacher at Lincoln, East, and Rams. Oh. 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 Flashlight on my phone. Well, that worked. Here, I'll stand next to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's currently working as, at Rams as an instructional technology coordinator while also serving as an educator effectiveness coach for the district. Nick stated his goal through his work as a social studies teacher was to provide students with skills and dispositions that would benefit them throughout their lives. In his EE coaching position, he has been part of a team that has implemented a process that serves as a model for great teaching and professional development in our district as well as our state. He feels that his experience as an instructional EE coach as well as a social studies teacher has allowed him to enhance both student, <coughs> student learning and teaching. Nick, a busy father of three girls, can also be found coaching at Lincoln as a football coach where he has helped organize the annual Raiders for a Cure to help raise awareness for breast cancer. This initiative has raised over $30,000 for the Riverview Aspirus Cancer Foundation. Colleague Van Ton's nomination for Nick stated, I am nominating Nick for his commitment and dedication to improving the culture not only within his classroom but also within his school. Nick has engaged students and adults with his desire to share and collaborate on everything from lessons to technology to professional development. Congratulations, Nick, on this very special recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Wisconsin Rapid School District since August 2006. He's taught fifth grade at Howe and Grove Elementary, and more recently he's been teaching sixth grade language arts at Rams. Bill's philosophy has been that his students do not care one bit about how much he knows until he shows them how much he cares. Bill states that some of his professional goals for his classroom include modeling hard work and accountability while demonstrating the love for the things greater than ourselves. As a basket goal coach, Bill facilitated an early morning study table. Student athletes who were not fulfilling their academic obligations were encouraged to attempt. At the completion, every student earned passing grades. 
Bill has also facilitated a men and boys mentorship night to teach leadership skills to the young men in our school and community. Bill's entire family is very involved with giving back to our community through church programs. Bill recently traveled to Africa to facilitate professional development for teachers at Subi Children's Center in Uganda. Tim Brun says of Mr. Oz, he's a quality individual who genuinely enjoys working with young people and strives to see them succeed both in the classroom and on the athletic field. Also, Mrs. Felker, a parent who nominated Bill, states, Mr. Oswald is a dynamic, insightful English teacher who inspires his students with his genuine character, personal stories, and current trends in technology and education. He's able to reach the most at-risk student to the very gifted student and does so with great enthusiasm. Thank you for the positive impact you're making not only in the field of education, Bill, but also outside the walls of your classroom in our community. Congratulations on being recognized as a Cole Teaching Fellowship Award winner. Last but certainly not least, Tracy Ginter. Tracy Ginter was initially hired in 1992 as an English language arts educator at West Junior High School. She became associate principal at West in 2002 and then assumed the role of principal in the same building in 2004. West Junior High School became the Wisconsin Rapids Area Middle School in 2010 and Tracy played a significant role in transitioning the building to its successful middle school model. Tracy has worked closely with her staff to implement initiatives such as collaborative teaming, co-teaching, and RTI. Professional development days in Tracy's building are spent learning about the students that they serve and to identify various ways to meet the needs of the whole child. Tracy has ensured that there is wraparound support for all students at Rams by offering opportunities such as the learning resource room, working lunches, and homework club. Students learn foundational skills through longer periods of time devoted to math and English language arts and multiple rotations in areas such as STEM, world languages, music, and art. Through her involvement on numerous district level committees, Tracy has been instrumental in the facilitation of the district's English language arts mission and vision and has assisted with the ELA acquisition process. Having held the position of district assessment coordinator in the district, Tracy has had responsibility in interpreting and disseminating information to her colleagues. She has mentored several teachers in administrative practic practicums and has encouraged others to pursue leadership roles within the district. As a community leader, Tracy has served on the board of directors for the Boys and Girls Club and has volunteered to coach for the local Park and Recreation Department. She's created long-lasting community connections through her partnership or through her participation in Citizens Police Academy and the Heart of Wisconsin Community Leadership Program. Superintendent Colleen Dickman says of Tracy, Tracy is a competent, dedicated, and intelligent professional. Being very organized, she ensures that managerial tasks are quickly taken care of, which then allows her to be in classrooms and spending more time working with and evaluating her teaching staff. I'm very pleased that she was selected as a recipient of the Cole Leadership Award. Congratulations, Tracy, on being one of the first principals in the state to receive the prestigious Cole Leadership Award. We're very proud of you. Thank you. somewhere in my phone, I'm not sure how to access it. Okay, um, next we will move on to the minutes. Okay, I would make a motion to approve the special board of education meeting closed session of May 3rd, the regular board of education meeting of May 8th, the special board of education meeting open and closed sessions of May 11th, and the special board of education meeting the facility workshop, which was May 24th, as approved this session. Okay. Okay, we have a motion a second to approve the special board of education meeting closed session minutes of May 3rd, the regular board of education meeting minutes of May 8th, the special board of education meeting open and closed session of May 11th, and the special board of education meeting facility workshop minutes of May 24th. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Next, we can move on to comments from citizens and delegations. Uh, the first one tonight is Tricia Jostin. We'd like to speak about special education. She need a flashlight? <laughs> <laughs> you need to step up being right in the front. Does someone have a flashlight? Here. Oh, yeah, I can see it. Okay. Thank you. I'm all right. We have a son with autism who will be moving from Think Academy to the middle school this fall. 
We recently had a home visit from his Katie Beckett state representative. We were talking about his transition. She recommended that we switch school districts or get the state involved to make sure his needs are being met. She said Rapids is not known to have a very good special ed program, which got me thinking. Our son used to go to summer school until the summer school special ed program was cut. At that time, I questioned Paul Mann and Trudy DeSimons. I was told there was not money for that program anymore, yet other districts still offer it. This year, I had a meeting with Matt Green and Steve Smith, where I told them my concerns. Matt then set up a follow-up meeting with Mary Mulski and Amanda Mansky. He did not attend that meeting or tell them my concerns. I asked if, from time to time, some regular ed kids could come into special ed to the room and work together. I was told regular ed kids have no time for that. I asked if my son could visit Rams a couple of times over the summer with another student and aid or teacher to make his transition easier, which was set up. The principal, who has never met my son, said that was not needed. So your typical child in our district gets basketball and volleyball camps, tennis and swim lessons, plus six weeks of summer school, and I can't get a couple of hours for my son. Also, my question with all the remodeling, what is special ed getting? Could we get a swing set or small playground area at the middle school? Rapids is a good district if you have a typical student, but with answers for like no money and no time for special ed, I think we can do better. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Angela Olson, virtual school curriculum and training for teachers and or students. Yeah, I hope I can read this. <laughs> so I will attempt to this. Um, I contemplated addressing the board several times and changed my mind, wanting instead to just leave this school district and all its issues behind. Um, being told by some you can't change the system. But I've decided that even if I leave, um, changes are necessary and it feels irresponsible to me not to make some of my concerns or suggestions known to the board. I've actually spoken to other people, but not to the board. Um, first and foremost is the fact that unless this has changed since I received the emails from Heather Rasmussen in April and May of this year, this district does not pay for faith-based curriculum materials for virtual school, but it pays for any other curriculum that a parent wants to use. Um, first of all, I ask, what is faith-based curriculum? Does that mean religious materials, including religion of Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, and others? A virtual school student's curriculum is not shared with the class, therefore it cannot be seen as offending other students. There are no other students to consider. Are we protecting teachers' rights if it offends their freedom? Need I remind you that the greatest colleges and universities in our country and the world even were founded as religious institutions. I believe that every environment, I believe that the very environment we're trying to create in the classroom, one of understanding and acceptance, is hindered in part by laws or rules put in place attempting to protect people's freedom. I find this ironic in our school district, considering according to Dr. Christ, who was a previous superintendent, our teachers didn't have to turn in lesson plans when he first, when he first started here. It made it sound like teachers could basically teach whatever they wanted, which would explain why my son's fifth grade teacher at the time was teaching the students that people are born gay, among other things. Apparently, this district is willing to pay teachers to teach whatever they want, but aren't willing to pay for students to learn what or how they want if it's faith-based materials. That sounds like discrimination to me. Another issue I have with this school district is what appears to me, their unwillingness to deal with situations in any other way than punishment, for example, detention, and many times without getting the facts of the situation first, or something like implementing mandatory psychological testing without taking measures to change the environment in the classroom and the school that would actually help with many of the things discovered by the testing. Simple things could be done, like conflict resolution and communication training for students, or staff being trained as such and being available to students for situations that arise thereby helping students with communication and understanding with other students and in fact even their teachers. I've discovered in my own life and with my own children that when discipline becomes more about punishment or teaching someone a lesson and perhaps even at times even more about obedience and less about learning and changing and growing, we lose something important in our relationships. Our schools are overdue for real change in these areas, but the changes I see being made aren't ones that directly um, deal with students and teachers themselves. 
and these are very necessary, maybe even more than the ones that you guys have been making, spending all the money on. And this, to me, doesn't cost near as much. Next, William Lynch, Westport School. Good evening. Uh, I'd just like to start by saying I've had some experience with dealing with uh, school buildings and et cetera. Just leading back to the 73 and 76 of the London Wisconsin Rapid School Board, I spent some time on the Public Property Committee. Uh, at the time, we were just beginning to build Rudolph and Lincoln High School. I've been on the county board, now, I believe, for 13 years. I spent four years of that time dealing with the Public Property Committee. I have to be on the fair commission where we've been doing some remodeling with buildings there at the Marshfield Fairgrounds, et cetera. Uh, the county just purchased a river block building. We just went through a bunch of remodeling there. And all I'm trying to say is that I'm a little bit familiar with you know, these larger commercial type buildings. Anyway, uh, I'd like to address some of the estimates at the Vesper School. We have a roof estimate of 318,000. Um, I had Michael's roofing out of Lacusa come out and take a look at it. Uh, Anyway, uh, his estimate was a little different procedure, but anyway, his estimate to replace it, if you, you know, if you thought you had to do that, was 255000 He also put in a, a bid for a repair bill of $3,000. In other words, uh, the very worst part of it, he said he could fix for you know $3,000. That's something I think you need to consider. Also, uh, I don't know who this other company is that you're using, but uh, Michaels is a local company, he uses local labor. They do a lot of work for the county. They do uh, all the Nacusas, uh, paper mills, et cetera. They're not a fly-by-night company. They've been around for years. They're, they're reputable. The other issue that we had was there's, there's a drain. There's a problem west of the school. There's a catch basin by the um, kitchen. I had Jolene uh, Drain Solutions Company come out and take a look at that. There's a drain that goes south to the ditch that drains through the culvert. And what their thought is is that that drain is plugged up on the far end due to some brush and trees and roots, and, and their suggestion would be to come in there and put in a new line. If it had to be replaced all the way from the culvert to where the catch basin is, it would probably be about 3,600. They think that probably it wouldn't have to go that far. It could be less. There's something else to consider. The other thing that was a huge estimate was the Univent, the heating system, and I've talked to some heating contractors that have worked in that building, been in the building, and it just seems to me that that's something that doesn't need to be replaced. It's kind of a deal where it's, you know, why are we replacing it if it isn't broken? For example, if you have a flat tire in a car, it doesn't mean you buy a whole new car. That's kind of where we're at. And the other thing is that uh, you say that, or it's been said, that there'd be substantial savings in the natural gas. Well, that might be, but you can buy a lot of natural gas for $400,000. It would seem to me that if you were gonna close it, or if you kept it open, it doesn't make sense to spend that kind of money. Uh, something that happened this Saturday night, uh, just another the story. Uh, my grandson happens to mow my lawn, he gets done on Saturday night, and I'm in the kitchen, and he comes in and sits down, and I had that article from the Vesper Closing. His parents don't get to wrap his paper and have me lay in there. And I was doing something else, and he picked it up and he read it. He's now 16 years old. He has gone to Vesper. Uh, and it was kind of comical in that when he got done reading that, what he said is, what did they expect with the enrollment drop? They took our 4K away by saying 4K kids from Wisconsin Rapids couldn't come to Vesper. They took away our virtual school, our charter school, and our sixth graders. And with constant, constant advertising about closing Vesper school, uh, where are we going here? Many uh, people, uh, opted to other districts. We lost about 25 students. He credits the Vesper School with helping him get to the point where he could jump two uh, math classes ahead and, and one science class. The Vesper is one of your uh, better academically rated schools in the district, if not the best. If Vesper School closes, parents have told me that the district will lose a lot more students, if not all, to other districts. We're in a unique situation where we're bordered by Auburndale and Pittsville. You've already lost 25. Just keep in mind, the Vesper School District brings in about $400,000 in property taxes to the Wisconsin Rapids District. 
Vesper is not alone in declining enrollments. Since 19, or 2009, overall enrollment is down over 500. I'll be giving you this information when I get done here, but uh, last year the Vesper School wasn't on the enrollment list for 4K. That's why we only had a few students enrolled. It's set up for failure. In closing, I'd like to suggest you wait to make a decision until after the new superintendent takes over. He may he'll come in with a new set of eyes and possibly some new ideas. You know, what's the hurry? And as you talk about Vesper, Vesper School is very important to our community. We'd like to see it stay there. Thank you. Yep. I'll give this information to Marina. Maybe she can pass it around. Is that okay? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Okay, next, so, Amy Ortner in BCAO. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amy Order, and I have a daughter going into third grade at BCA and a son going into kindergarten. I'm not originally from the area, but we moved to Vesper about 16 years ago. The fact that they had an elementary school was something that I really liked. We are here today not only because we love our little school, but also because we love our little town. And the last thing it needs is another empty building. Especially when our students and teachers at BCA were the only school within the WRPS to significantly exceed expectations with the state school report cards. And we were 7.7 .7 points above the next highest scoring school in the district. I truly believe if BCA was promoted for what it is, our numbers would grow. We need to talk more about how BCA is the only project-based learning school within the Wisconsin Rapids School District and that it has done so well because of it instead of the constant talk of when is BCA shutting down. I know our numbers would grow. Since moving to Vesper, I've heard constant talk of the school possibly closing, and at first I was unsure if I was going to send my children to BCA because I feared exactly what is happening, that my daughter would get to third or fourth grade and the school board would shut down the school. So I understand why there are people open and rolling out of the district to Pittsville or Auburndale. But instead of kids leaving, we should have kids from those schools open and rolling into BCA. We scored 13.1 points above Pittsville and almost 10 points above Auburndale. I believe if the school board chose to keep BCA open and invest in the students and teachers who deserve to be rewarded for their achievements, that we would have people that would come to BCA for the project-based learning. Their kids could be at the, the only school in the area that significantly exceeded expectations and still keep the small town atmosphere. People like my husband and I chose to live out in a small town for a reason. We want to allow our children to be children for as long as possible. Our daughter loves dressing up for Halloween, singing in the Christmas concert, and having an ABC countdown at the end of the year. We still get to have that in Vesper. I know many, if not all the other schools in the district do not have these things. We want these things for our kids. We want them to be sheltered from the politics of the world as long as possible. VCA gives us that and can give other children that as well. It gives us a sense of family and community. I love that the fifth grade teacher knew who my daughter was in 4K. The teachers get to know them and learn what works for them years before they even enter their class. It is such a gift. I know that there are many wonderful teachers and schools within the district, but BCA is something indescribable. That is why parents and community members fought and continue to fight to keep it open. Please don't use the 4K numbers to talk about declining enrollment at BCA when it hasn't been even listed as an option for the past three years, but people are still writing it in in the hopes that you will bring it back. We know how important a 4K is in building numbers at our school. I heard on the news Friday morning that there is talk of trying to raise the amount of money the district would receive per student for rural schools. I don't know if that would pertain to us because we fall within the Wisconsin Rapid School District, but I think that should be something that should be looked into. Why shut down your rural school if you could receive more money per student? I know there has also been talk of moving our children to Rudolph amongst other options, but it is difficult to jump on board with this when I know my children will go from a four minute bus ride to most likely a 45 minute to an hour bus ride especially when we have a wonderful school that just needs the repairs it should, have been, it should have been getting through the years. I know this is a hard decision. I just hope you reward the staff and students for all they do. Thank you. I guess there are lights in the cafeteria. Um, do you want to continue on here in the dark or do we want to move into the cafeteria? That's what you indicated, correct? Yep. Yeah, that's on generator power in there. Okay. We'll take a little break here to move into the cafeteria. Uh, then our, our business services meeting started at 6 p.m. on June 5th. Um, 
It was called in order at 6 o'clock. We did have public comment from Mr. Witch in which he addressed the, just about the, the same item that he addressed to us tonight at the board, uh, board meeting. Um, and we took that information and, and moved it forward. We couldn't comment on that specific issue because it wasn't on the agenda. Uh, then I do have, out of our meeting, we have nine consent agenda items, which is kind of like a record for our business services. Normally, the same is around of that many, that many items. Uh, does anybody want, wish to have anything held out? Um, hearing nothing, I will go into the first one, which was a dissolution of the school insurance risk management uh, cooperative. Uh, this was a A group that we had been with, and it served for the organizational pool for school risks uh, when bidding property and workman's compensation liability insurances. Um, the members feel we should be better served to dissolve the SIRMC at this time and join the Wisconsin Educated Risk Management Cooperative, uh, which is another school management as forming a large pool of schools. Uh, so the fourth, the committee recommends, and I move that we dissolve the school insurance risk management. We're going to go through all of them? I think we'll do one at a time. Okay, I have second. Some of them are yeses and some of them okay, are Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve BS1. Dissolution uh, of the school insurance risk management cooperative. All those in favor of the CI? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. All right, then the second item is the, the following up of joining the Wisconsin Educators Risk Management Cooperative. Um, so I would move that we do a 66.0301 agreement for participation in Wisconsin Education Risk Management Cooperative. Second. Okay, we have a motion a second to approve a 66.0301 agreement for participation in the Wisconsin Education Risk Management Cooperative. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right, our next item was uh, presented by Phil as far as uh, purchasing 175 HP Chromebooks from PBS at a total cost of $32,768.75, which would be funded from the 2017-18 school district budget. I, uh, the committee recommends that I move this for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the purchase of 175 HP Chromebooks from PDS at a total cost of $32,000. $768.75 to be funded from the 1718 District Technology Budget. Yeah, we'll call, please, Mr. Medina? Yes. Mr. Bembo? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Cranes? Yes. Mrs. Hutt? Yes. Mrs. Moreno? Yes. Mr. Moreno? Yes. Just to be noted that that, uh, that price is for the notebook was $163.25. And if you go on Amazon and anywhere else, uh, Phil did a wonderful job of getting some good pricing on that because they're about $199 to $200 anywhere you look in the, in the general market for that type of uh, product. All right, our next item was, again, to upgrade our monitors um, at uh, our elementary buildings. So the committee recommends and I move that we purchase 250 ACES monitors from CDWG at a total cost of $17,497.50 to be funded from the 2017-18 district technology budget for a recommendation to the board. Second. Okay, we have a motion second to approve the purchase of 250 ACES monitors from CDWG at a total cost of $17,497.50 to be funded from the 2017-18 district technology budget. Yeah, roll call, please. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Rail? Yes. Mrs. Hutt? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Pembo? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mr. Cranes? Yes. And a note on those is those are $69.99 per monitor, and they're 18 and a half inch, and they're also LED monitors, which uh, will do uh, uh, probably a large amount of energy savings versus the old uh, bulb and two big, big monitors that we currently are in use. Um, e, or BS5, is a motion to do the parking lot replacement at Pink Academy. Uh, this parking lot was built uh, pretty close to 30, 35 years ago, and it was built on a base. Uh, it was telling us that it's on granite, 
and anybody knows anything about granite, um, granite the, basically decays, and when it decays, it sinks, and that's what's happening to the parking lot, is basically it's sinking into itself. So uh, the committee recommends, and I move, that we accept a proposal from American Asphalt to report Pink Academy parking lot at a cost of 60179 for approval to the Board of Education. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the proposal from American Asphalt to repair the Think Academy parking lot at a cost of $60,179. We have roll call, please, Maureen. Mrs. Hett? Yes. Mr. Krings? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mr. Bambo? Yes. Mrs. Rail? Yes. Thank you, Maureen. <coughs> and then uh, along with that, uh, Ed did tell us that there's going to be a Four to five hundred foot sidewalk put in. Is that correct, Ed? Seven hundred fifty. Seven hundred fifty foot sidewalk to uh, uh, about six feet wide of, con uh, of, of blacktops, so that uh, this they can walk along the uh, without walking on the road. Correct. Yep. All right. The next items are uh, basically uh, some policies that we had not updated or looked at for a, a little bit. So the first one is policy four fifty eight student wellness, and this is for first reading. And the committee recommends that I move that we accept the proposed revisions to board policy 458 student wellness policy for first reading. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the proposed revisions to board policy 458 student wellness policy for first reading. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, the second item is policy 458R for nutrition, uh, nutrition guidelines first reading. Uh, the committee recommends and I move that we propose, accept the proposed revisions to board policy 458R nutrition guidelines for first reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the proposed revisions to board policy 458 rule nutrition guidelines for first reading. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, then the next one is a policy 760R. Uh, food service management guidelines for first reading. Uh, the committee recommends and I move that the proposed revisions to board policy 760R food service management guidelines be accepted to the Board of Education. Second. Do we have a motion to second to approve the proposed revisions to board policy 760 rule food service management guidelines for first reading. All those in favor please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And then as a note to that, uh, Lizzie brought these all forward saying that uh, most of the um, changes to these guidelines are to bring them up to current policy and uh, current um, current policies and current laws uh, so that we're, uh, everything is up to the current standards that are required uh, us to be up. Our last uh, consent agenda item was Wisconsin School Nutri Nutrition Purchasing Cooperative. And this would be a 63.0301 agreement. We were in a cooperative that was through CISA 2. However, CISA 2 was starting to give a little more um, control, and some of the fees were getting a little high. Uh, so uh, it was the general feeling to uh, uh, join the new cooperative, which is an uh, agreement made within the central Wisconsin area through uh, multiple school districts. So the committee recommends and I move that we uh, propose, move the proposed Wisconsin Nutrition Purchasing Cooperative uh, 66.0301 agreement for the approval to the school board. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the proposed Wisconsin School Nutrition Purchasing Cooperative 66.0301 agreement. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion <coughs> carries. Then the balance of our meeting, we had updates and reports for the Discovery Education, which is the online library services, uh, along with Follett uh, software, and then Frontline Education, which is our support staff time and attendance software. Um, and at this time, we have no uh, future uh, agenda items that were identified. So with that, uh, the committee recommends that I move to uh, accept the balance of our meeting. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the meeting minutes of the Business Service Committee. Uh, June 5th, 2017. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion <coughs> carries. Those minutes are approved. Thank you, John. Let's go move on to personnel services. Andy. Uh, personnel services met June 5th at 6 p.m. Um, we had no public comment, but from that meeting, we have seven consent agenda items, and they are as follows. Number one, the committee recommends and I move to approve the two 2017 Summer Technology Support Appointments. 
Two, the committee recommends and I move to approve the two support staff appointments. Three, the committee recommends and I move to approve the six support staff resignations. Uh, fourth, the committee recommends and I move to approve the one support staff early retirement. Fifth, the committee recommends and I move to approve a benefit adjustment for school psychologists to take effect on July 1st, 2017 to change the early retirement health insurance section of psychologists' employee benefit documents as discussed in committee, including to provide psychologists the same early retirement health insurance as offered to our teachers. Six, the committee recommends and I move to approve a 2016 wage increase of 0.12% for confidential secretaries retroactive to July 1st, 2016. Uh, seven, the committee recommends and I move to approve a one-time wage payment for the fiscal year 2016-17 to office clerical and aid support staff employed with the district on June 1st, 2017 to be calculated at 0.12% of each individual employee's wage rate multiplied by the employee's total annual assignment position hours and rounded to the nearest dollar and paid out as a flat even dollar. This is saying some of these would have a two cent per hour wage increase. And if they were to have three hours of this service in the afternoon and pick up some other hours at a different rate in the afternoon, it would cost us much more money to kind of calculate that than to just do a flat dollar out. Um, we're looking at perhaps um, $345 more. And we have 250 people in this group, so it could be t quite time consuming for our business services to do this. Um, does anybody want anything held out? Oh, wait. I was there. Okay, sorry. Okay, we have a motion to second to approve PS1 through PS7. We have roll call vote, please, Marie. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mr. Bengal? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Krings? Yes. Mrs. Hett? Yes. Mrs. Rayon? Yes. Um, an aside to the, um, the confidential secretaries, we did discuss um, potential benefit adjustments for our confidential employees. But we decided to take no action on this, um, and this will be coming forthcoming at a future meeting. We have six that are in this uh, category, um, three in business services, two in HR, and one are our uh, board secretaries. Updates, um, supplemental pay for professional staff employees. Um, discussion includes potential use of supplemental pay offers we needed to hire new teachers Yeah. 
2010, 2011. Um, in that time, it was $35,400 for co-curricular co coaching positions. Um, and this has been in place since, like I said, 2010, 2011 school year. And we're thinking of increasing the base wage calculated to the amount of $37,500. Um, recommendations for potential adjustments will be brought back in the future with possible action in the future. is that those previously those coaches that were in an hourly position were exempt and able to take the stipend is that correct and now with the new change in the law that is no longer no longer exempt and they can no longer just be paid the stipend so that's why the change is coming about and that's why it's uh, going to be concerning because it's going to be dealing with it over time
Educational Services Committee members were shown how staff, parents, and students will be involved in the program. Board members recommended the committee for their, um, commended, I'm sorry, the committee for their hard work and time in developing the plan. Um, the proposed academic and career planning process for WRPS students um, will be implemented in 2017-18. With that, the committee recommends and I move uh, adoption of ES1 through ES5. Second, okay, we have motion to move ES1 through ES5. We have motion. Mrs. Brown? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Head? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Craigs? Yes. Mr. Bevel? Yes. Then we went on to updates, and the first one was about the elementary Chinese exchange. Mr. Rasmussen and Kelly, Kelly Schaefer, who's principal of Washington School, explained the elementary Chinese exchange program. Chinese fifth grade students would experience a typical week with grade uh, five students at Washington Elementary School. The program would encourage Chinese students to participate in the high school exchange when they are older. We were all quite amazed that uh, Chinese parents would send their fifth graders uh, over to the United States for two weeks, but it sounds like a wonderful program, both for the Chinese students and for our student out-of-state travel update. Uh, Kathy Stebbins hints shared that 85 music students will be traveling to Chicago on June 14th to attend Aladdin. Seven uh, Lincoln High School students will attend the International HOSA or HOSA Leadership Conference in Orlando, Florida from uh, June 20th to June 25th and that organization has to do with uh, With that, the committee recommends, and I move that we uh, accept the minutes of the June 5th Education Services Committee meeting. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the Educational Services Committee meeting minutes of June 5th, 2017. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries and it's approved. John. Yes. Before we move on, I'd like to just point out that uh, ES5, which is the Academic and Career Planning, that is a state mandate now, and it's an unfunded mandate, which has to be applied next year, correct? Correct. But I'd also like to point out that our school district has been doing basically this program for our high school students from 9 to 12. Uh, I know my daughter, who graduated in 2009, we had meetings with their counselor once or twice a year where we went in and talked about career planning. And then my son graduated in 2014, had the same experience. So our district has been doing this, and we are also piloting the program for UPI, correct? And, yes. and helping them work out bugs and, and providing information back to them. So uh, this district has been ahead of the curve in this, this area, which I uh, would like to recommend everybody that's been involved in that program, and our, our counselors and our administrators, because it is an important program for our kids and it helps our kids when they want to decide where they're going to go for their secondary post education, post high school education. Can't figure out a way to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> we are signing a leadership conference for GPI in August. So um, we are visiting the campus. They did last year as well. Yes, we did last year. So thank you, Kathy, for your work and your team. Oh, and the whole group. Thank you, Adam, and thank you. Yep. Next, we'll move on to agenda referrals, information requests. Do we have anything to vote? Okay, we can move on to the legislative agenda. John, what do you have to share this one? I think I still got some internet here. So, um, Congress has hit, uh, signed the spending bill through September 30th. I'm not sure exactly what that's going to mean in terms of, but uh, one of the things that I noticed here, it says the overall the education area for the fiscal year 2017 omnibus bill makes net cuts of about $1.1 billion, but provides more than a billion dollar increase compared to the comparable 2016 funding levels for Title I grants for disadvantaged students in special education. Um, impact aid and student support programs under Title IV is on the board, is on cuts, I believe, also. 
Uh, the other issue that is, is with the change in Obamacare and the cost of Medicaid, a lot of people don't understand that that Medicaid provides support and money for special, special education. So you need to be aware that if you're cutting $880 billion over the next 10 years out of Medicaid, that will directly affect special education. In, I don't know what the percentages are. Do we have a percentage? The 20 to 20? Uh, well, uh, it's it's approximately $200,000 a year that we receive in Medicaid reimbursement. So it's a reimbursement for services that we have already delivered. Um, so in, in, in final reimbursement for 14, 15. Um, so things like speech and language, um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, those things that um, investing in um, early education for students pays dividends down the road, and we're obligated through IDA to, to provide those services. So um, we just wouldn't be reimbursed on the back end for those services. So that's the point: is that uh, there's, there's, what's happening in Washington could impact special special education even more. Uh, secondly, the USDA relaxed school meals nutrition and talking in, in our committee meetings and with Lizzie that she's very uncertain what that means and right now for the foreseeable, foreseeable future in the next couple of years it probably isn't going to make too much of a difference in changing uh, the meals and, and the program that we have going right now. Um, there is a bill to seek transparency on property tax impact of voucher funding. Um, it's a hot topic is that people will understand how much they are paying, how much of their property taxes is going to support uh, private schools. And that's essentially what it is. 78% uh, of the people that were under the voucher program were already enrolled at the private institutions of the Catholic the public, you know, all the parochial and all the schools that are uh, requested um, voucher money. So that is basically a subsidy of private schools by the, by the taxpayers' money. And the other part along with that is, is that the private schools at this time do not have the same accountability standards, and uh, that's one of the things that the uh, WASB and the public education groups are, are pushing is that, you know, fine, if you're going to give public money, then they have to meet the testing standards and all the other standards that we have to meet along with that to receive public uh, dollars. That is um, all that we have going on right now, other than the budget and the talk of the $200. I believe right now the $200 per pupil is going to remain intact, but uh, that's still up for discussion. So I'm going to make the final decision, which is supposed to have been uh, next week, because June 15th is, is the future. June 30th is their budget deadline date. So, so we'll have to stay tuned on that. I find it interesting that when we have the health care problems we have in our country, and when the uh, department of, uh, when, when the, they put uh, rigorous standards on our school lunches, and they were helping, that we would loosen those that were helping with obesity and with lack of wellness. That, that seems to me to be the opposite direction that we should be going. Okay, thank you for your report, John. Let's move on to the bills. Okay, I would make a motion that the receipts be noted and the bills be paid as printed. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second that the receipts be noted and bills paid as printed in our packets. Uh, we have a call, please, Mr. Davis? Yes. yes. Mrs. Rail? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Bumble? Yes. Mrs. Head? Yes. Mrs. Regina? Yes. Mrs. Greens? Yes. Thank you, Maroon. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Next, we'll move into new business. Uh, item A, possible action on employee appointments, resignations, and retirement requests. Mr. Craig said it would be used to be distributed uh, for the board and a handout that shows a list of some additional uh, personnel approval for the board. Uh, we have, unfortunately, since our committee meeting just a week ago, we had uh, three new additional resignations come in. Uh, and uh, 
positive side. We've had one um, new, new appointment that we've secured in hoping to get approval from the board this evening. So unfortunately, the three resignations are all in the special education area. Um, but we are in process already of doing the best we can to try to fill all of, all of those assignments. Um, the appointment recommendation for new math teacher does tie to a resignation we have a science teacher. We've made an adjustment within our middle level staffing um, to hire a, a math person that can do some of the new science opening that we have. So unless there's any questions that the board would like uh, us to address, we do recommend approval of, of the three resignations and the one appointment. I would make a motion to approve the three professional staff resignations as, as presented to us and also vote on professional staff assignment. I second that. Okay, we have a motion a second to approve the three professional staff resignations and the one professional staff assignment presented. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Those are approved. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, item B, consideration and possible action to approve a resolution authorizing the transfer of funds and the establishment of an escrow account with respect to and the feasance of certain of the general obligation refunding bond series 2015 dated June 29th, 2015. That was a mouthful. Since you can. <laughs> um, the board has been that for another year now. And uh, this defeats us four years worth of payments on our last uh, bond issue. And what it's doing is making room um, in the levy um, for some uh, energy, well, one of them is energy project at Lincoln High School, um, energy portion of that project at Lincoln High School. And then in future years, if the board uh, wanted to do some other projects, um, we would also have, they would have the room in the levy without an increase in the levy to, to do those projects. And it also saves money by people. Any other questions? I'd uh, make a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the borrowing of not to exceed oh, 11. No, 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 me. Oops. Motion to approve the resolution authorizing transfer of funds established in escrow account with respect to the defeasance of certain general obligation refund Refunding bond series 2015 dated June 29th, 2015. Second. And we have a motion a second to approve resolution authorizing the transfer of funds, establishment of an escrow account with respect to and the defeasance of certain of the general obligation refunding bond series 2015 dated June 29th, 2015. Okay, we have a roll call, please, please. Mrs. Rail? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Yes. Mr. Bevel? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mr. Credding? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Dan, would these be the QSAB? Pardon? Is this a QSAB uh, funding or is that? No. Uh, this is not. QSAB uh, is not. There is no interest on that. Correct. QSAB uh, cannot be paid related. Okay. That's what I trust. I wanted to make sure. I, I said the last one, but QSAB is still off. They're all still Okay. That's why I was concerned. Right, I'm sorry. I asking I'm sorry. whether it was the QZ. Okay. No, the QZ is still on. Okay. Okay, we can move on to item C, resolution authorizing the borrowing of not to exceed eleven million five hundred thousand dollars and providing for issuance and sale of general obligation promissory notes. Okay, this right now in neither the House nor the Senate version of the budget bill going forward. The energy conservation or energy, uh, what it was called? Exemption. Exemption for energy conservation projects is no longer in the budget bill. Um, what this does is this preserves the board authority under current law to go to select some projects to do at Lincoln if they chose to. Um, one of the projects we're going to do or we're, we will be doing at Lincoln is the pool and the locker rooms, which you've already approved. That won't be done with any borrowing. Um, it's other projects that will be presented on the 26th. They've done a study at Lincoln and have a list of projects, and you could select from that list, and uh, this would authorize you to borrow money to do those projects if you chose to do so. Um, if the if if it's re, if it's not in the budget for next year and the and we don't do this, you would not be allowed to borrow money to do an energy project. 
So this just reserves that right. You don't. It doesn't you, obligate you. You don't obligate you. It just authorizes you to do it if you um, see, here, see the presentation and, and decide to do a project. Okay. So it's more precautionary. Well, gives us the. <coughs> Right. Gives you a latitude under current law. Under current law, correct. So this time I'll make the motion to approve a resolution authorizing the borrowing of not to exceed $11.5 million and providing for issuance of the sale of general obligation promissory notes. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second to approve a resolution authorizing the borrowing of not to exceed $11.5 million and providing for the issuance and sale of general obligation promissory notes. We have a roll call, please, Mark. Mr. Hatt? Yes. Mr. Braille? Yes. Mr. Bevel? Yes. Mr. Springs? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Thank you, Marine. Uh, last item tonight is discussion and possible action to approve Esper Community Academy facility closure beginning with 118-19 Street. I don't know if we have anything else to present. Um, we've spent two workshops giving you information. Um, we've heard from several um, people in the public tonight. Um, so I, I would open it up for your discussion and decision at this point. Well, I'll start off. Um, I know firsthand about school closures. I was involved in one in 2006 when Children's Choice uh, School was abruptly closed, ironically, in this room. Um, at that time, uh, three schools were up. It was Vesper, Children's Choice, and Pitch. Uh, Children's Choice was closed in 2006, and ironically, this will be, this upcoming class will be the last, or will be the senior class of the kindergartners that were in our school when it closed. So uh, we, we established a scholarship fund and this will be the last class that we are, that will actually be available for that scholarship fund. And then at, uh, actually this uh, next summer, we're gonna have to meet and change the guidelines on how we disperse that scholarship fund. Um, it is an emotional time. It is not easy decision. Um, at that time, it was budgetary. Um, I believe, I don't know how many years, was pitch closed two years later? I don't recall. 2008. 2008, so it was two years later. So we had two school closures then. We had 2006, we had Children's Choice. 2008, we had Pitch. At the time when Choice closed, there was 143 students in that school. Um, at the time when Pitch closed, there was 185 students in that school. Um, it's not an easy decision, but the bottom line is, is that Board of Education and the whole school district has to be looked at as far as the overall cost per student, per pupil, and what's best in the long run, and as we go forward uh, in the next two to three to five years, what's uh, the best for the education of the whole school district. So a lot of the comments, I, I remember doing the same thing. Um, the fortunate part of, uh, with our closure is the school board was dragging it out for almost eight, eight to nine months before they and they weren't prepared, I, I don't believe they were gonna make a decision that night until basically the crowd and everybody that was in the tent asked them to make some <laughs> um, That was extremely frustrating as a parent, not knowing what was going on. So I know one of the parts, uh, one of the reasons I got on the school board was to do that so that people aren't stuck out for six, eight, nine months of what's happening. Um, as a school board and as a school board member, I believe it's our responsibility to make a decision one way or the other. Um, and they're not popular. I mean, it definitely is not a popular decision in any way, shape, or form. And um, uh, weighing a lot of all the information, I know uh, Mr. Winch has been bringing things forward as far as ways to uh, try to save some money, but the bottom line is, is that you still have to do certain repairs to keep a school viable. And uh, sometimes you, you can get away with certain things, but when you come talking about heating and HVAC, there are codes we have to require, air exchanges per national and, and state standards. Um, all of that has changed over the past. I mean, the air handling units that were originally put into Lincoln would not be acceptable in today's society or today's building construction. So. Everything changes, standards changes and everything else. So some of the costs that, that people don't understand, 
are dealing with codes and, and laws and regulations and airflow, uh, EPA requirements for air, quality of air in the building. So there are a lot of things that go into that, that, type, that type of, uh, those type of projects and, and what has to happen when you do remodeling and that type of, type of uh, construction on any building. Um, I guess I can add to you know, John's story. I had a son that I have a son that was a children's choice student that moved his sixth grade year um, when the school closed. And when the motion was made, which I made to close the pitch, I had a niece at that school. So I understand what you people are saying. I blew it. So these decisions are not things that we enjoy. We have to look out for the better of the entire district, not just one school in the district. And the building, uh, Mr. Winch addressed the water runoff from the building to the street, but that doesn't really address the low end of the building where the water is sitting. That talks to the water running away from the school, but that one end of the school building where the kitchen is, is puddling water there. I mean, that really would require some pretty major excavation to repair it where it would not be an issue anymore. Um, we saw pictures of damage to the walls. Structurally, that building needs some work. It's not simple fixes. So, I'd like to make a comment about, I don't, something that has bothered me has been the derogatory comments I've heard about our students at Mead School. And if anything, that has encouraged me to think that rather than touting how great you are at Vesper, which I don't deny that the grades are wonderful and everything else, the Mead School students are our students too. And I would prefer to help those students who are being thrown under the bus basically by people who say, well, our test scores are so good, and you know, we don't want our students to go with those students. I, I just find that very insulting for those students. Um, our school district is responsible for all of the students. And for people to, to, to behave that way or talk that way about um, another population that is part of our community, I just think that's very, very disrespectful. I guess I'd like to add, this is, I believe, my 18th year. So I was on the board in this room when we closed Children's Choice. I was on the board when we closed Pitch. They are hard decisions. And I've, I've got the letters that were emailed to me. I didn't answer um, over email. I don't do that very often just because I don't like to answer that way. Um, I appreciate your comments. And I did visit. I have been to Vesper School over the past years four or five times, probably best for more than some of the other schools in our district. And it's wonderful. I come away from there feeling, wow, project-based learning, I mean, that, it's great. All kids don't learn the same. I, I'm a big proponent of that. But we have to look at, at the whole district. And, and your test scores are great. Yes, they are. You know, we don't want to take that away. I, I'm hoping that in some of our choices, we can keep the project-based learning, that you aren't going to lose the small the smallest. We, we can't, we don't all learn the same. I, I understand that, but, and it's not an easy decision. Um, we, we've taken everything into consideration. We've, we've, with our strategic plan, we've been looking at when can we move the ninth graders. We've, we've slowly made changes, trying to get as much input as we can from everyone. We're just seven people like you are, doing the best we can do with the information we have. This decision is difficult for me. I'm a country guy. I like a small school like Vesper. I like the atmosphere that you can have in the country um, where you're make probably more free than you are here in town. Um, and it was good there. That kind of learning was effective. The kids enjoyed it and, and, and achieved. And uh, the staff was doing a great job. Um, I think we were doing wonderful things there. Um, why can't we continue to do those things? Well, you have to look at the whole district. And you can't um, allow things that, uh, that aren't enough students. And uh, it's too expensive to run that school. And we just have, you can't disregard that. Um, I know it's difficult to talk about politics, but 
this board, all every single one of us, are trying to get things changed in Madison so that we are bleeding our schools continually, taking from here and trying to fix that. And uh, in the last election, we lost one of our best people who supported schools, Julie Lassa. Um, it isn't getting any better. What more can we do when we go down there and say, don't do that? We were accused when they were here three weeks ago of being negative because we didn't like th what they were doing. And I say, that's the way it is. You're not doing it right. You're not properly funding our public schools and voucher schools, stifling away money and other things. Uh, this isn't the way it should be. We have, just as we heard tonight, special ed teachers. I mean, we used to have plenty. Now they can, re they can uh, resign and go somewhere else very easily. There's a shortage of teachers. I know uh, Mr. Christensen was saying how many candidates we had for one position seven or eight years ago, and how, how much has it gone down, Ryan? It's just plummeted. People are not, you know, it's just not working. Larry, has anyone figured out why there's a lack of interest on the part of the younger generation to join the profession? Well, I was on, talking you can share it with us. Sure, I was talking with Act uh, 10. Uh, yes, it's Act 10. In fact, I was oh, getting really? I was I was in a business talking and one of the kids, the young kids that were there said, I'm gonna be a teacher. And I said, Great, come here. We have good things happening here. Come here if you want to be a teacher. And he said, you know, uh, the people at my school tried to talk me out of it. Now, that's the kind of thing we don't need. We need people who say, go into teaching. You can do great things. You can change the world. Uh, but when the morale is not as good, that's what you have. There was something in Vietnam, Larry, that uh, military guys picked up on when you were walking down the street. No sidewalks. If it looked like crap, smelled like crap, and tasted like it, guess what? It was. I'm done. Yes. Uh, I, I see from the uh, minutes from business services, it said, uh, the committee asked Mr. Allison uh, from our buildings and grounds director to provide us information concerning the concerns that uh, Mr. Winch brought up. So can you address those for us? Like $3,000 roof repair and... Sure, we're doing roof repairs every year now. There's probably 75 to 100 patches. They're temporary, there's moisture between um, the two layers of, of roofing material. So it causes big bubbles. When you get the freeze saw cycle in there, it punctures those bubbles and we have more water into the insulation. Um, I provided uh, Bill with some information. That engineering study was done back in 2007, already looking at the HVAC system. The whole part, um, the ductwork is inaccessible. I mean, there's no way to get in it. Uh, the school is slab on grade, so it's a uh, slab of concrete just like in your garage with a school built on it. They dug out an air plenum alongside of the building, right on the frost wall. That's where all the air goes that serves those classrooms. Not ideal. I mean, from an air quality standpoint, it wouldn't have done that way today. Um, the engineering study recommended putting univents in each room, so you're sucking air, individual air, into each room, heating and or cooling that space. Um, like Bill said, uh, Michael's Roofing on Nakusa, they do great work. I know all those guys down there. It's a different roof system than what we have. Um, that's a single ply, 30 mil. Ours is a 30 and a 20, so it's almost twice as thick. And that would be a serviceable roof for you know, 10, 15 years. But for $50,000, I'd rather go with what we have. It's a higher quality roof system. We've also had fantastic service with that, too. Oh, right, yeah. I mean, unbelievable. We just, uh, they just gave us $4 million worth of roof work for warranty work on a 10-year-old roof. Now, generally, they prorate a roof, 
if there's, you know, the serviceable life on this roof would be about 35 years, the seat blast roofs that we have on, on all of our buildings. Um, generally, they'd prorate that and give you a settlement for materials only, not labor. They sent their vice president out, and, uh, out from Texas, and right off the bat, he said, you know, we acknowledge there's a problem, we're gonna fix it. Labor and materials, over $4 million. The cost to replace the cap sheet on, on all the roofs. So, I mean, they're a, they're a great company, not taken away from Michael's Roofing. I'm good friends with a couple of their guys, um, actually one of their, their vice president. They're, uh, they're great, they do great work, different style of roof. It would work on the building. I mean, it would work and it'd be serviceable for 10, 15, 20 years, probably 20 years even. But long term, um, you know, things are done the WRPS way, and that's why, like this building we're sitting in, was built in 1931. I have people come through here and, you know, they're, they remark at how well our buildings are kept up. You know, it's, it's three, four generations of upkeep like that. We did things on the cheap, we were re rebuilding schools by now. And as long as we're talking about styles, too, I believe that, uh, yeah, I think you are thinking of, <laughs> Uh, uh, going to project-based learning as well. So we're not losing that key component to the Vesper Academy. I think there's one other point I'd like to say is that all of our schools are very good, high quality schools, yes. and they have good staff in all of them. Um, I read each and every letter that I received in the email uh, again, I don't respond to email because stuff can be cut and pasted and taken out of context and that type of thing, and that uh, serves no purpose. Um, you're always welcome to call, and I can discuss. I will discuss issues on the phone and that type of thing, but I will never respond to to anybody in email just because of that. Things that happen that get taken out of context or a snippet gets put into something else and that type of thing. And I agree with your concerns, but the one thing that did bother me is some of the tone of some of the people that were saying that their school was like the best thing since sliced bread. And I, I took offense to that because you know, all of our schools are good. Each one of our schools has a, its own problems. Um, I don't know if a lot of people realize that Mead has, I don't know the exact number, but if they have 400 kids in that building, 150 of them turn over. By the end of the start, from the start of the school year to the end of the school year, of that 400, there's 150 different students in there because of the transient um, waves of, of migrant workers and different people that we have in the building. Um, Grove, for example, has a higher population of um, Hmong community because they live in that area. So I mean, all of our schools have different challenges, but all of them provide a very quality education, which um, test scores are related to some of our schools don't have all of the special ed education children, or they don't have the kids with the different needs and the learning disabilities. Um, and uh, of course, there's all kinds of reasons why test scores are one way or the other uh, in a building. And I just just don't like it when people talk compare one, one elementary to another, saying that it's so much better, so much worse, so much this. All of our schools have great teachers. I mean, our teachers are second to none in this district. They, they do so much. I mean, the gentleman asked about why people are getting the teachers into education. It's because of Afghan and what's happened to the overall perception, per, per, perception of how teachers have been treated and the, res, the lack of respect that they get. I ask any of you, where would you be today without your teachers? We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be having the jobs we have. We wouldn't have the colleges, going to the colleges we went to. Teachers are an integral part of everybody's education. And the fact that we're attacked every day is, is frustrating to me that our teachers are attacked. I'm married to a teacher, and she teaches in another district, but she does a phenomenal job. And the fact that the legislator says that anybody can be a teacher, bull on it. Not anybody can be a teacher. You cannot take a CEO from a company and put them in a classroom. He'll be eaten alive. 
you have to understand the needs of children. And everybody talks about the special education kids and how the, they change the, you can't segregate them anymore. They have to be mainstreamed in the classroom and that type of thing to the point of, uh, with um, you know, well, better than normal education kids, I guess. I don't know how else better to say it. But there are things that change through Madison, through the, the, the legislator that dictate to what we can do as a school board and what the monies we get and how we can teach kids and everything else that goes along with it. So it is extremely frustrating um, when we have our teachers attacked um, by various groups because you know, I can name my elementary teachers yet to this day. My kindergarten and all the way up, uh, once I get to fifth and sixth, we have multiple teachers. But all of them had a part of who I am today and where I would be today. So to say that anybody can be a teacher is not true. You cannot have anybody be teachers. And it is extremely hard. And ACTEM did do some good things for school districts, but did probably more damage in the long run to the teaching profession and to our ability because now basically teachers are free agents. And that's why we're losing teachers. It isn't because the, the district is poor, it's just the fact that they have opportunity to get paid much more money than other places where that never was a, 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 a can issue. You share, can you share uh, uh, where that attitude that you alluded to, anybody can be a teacher, where's that originating from? Where's that coming from? Um, Give us a name. State legislator. Uh, that's, no. State, the state mandated a bill. So we're, it's not a discussion. It's, I don't have specifics of the name, but it was through the state of Wisconsin. There was a legislator that provi provided a, a bill saying that anybody can teach. John, John I'm an old salesman. Hey, Jim, uh, no. it's not on the agenda, so we're going to stick with what we're talking about here. Thank you, John. I'm familiar with me. Was in the eighth grade, first eighth grade class there, and I try and visit often. And it is not easy there because a lot of society's difficulties and problems come to school for those children. And uh, the staff there does just great, great work. And um, I agree with uh, with Katie that uh, I could get test scores real high by just picking the students. It would be easy. Just find the, find the best students and bring them in there. Yeah, that's great. No problems, and, and it's much better. But when you have society's problems in, in, in place, it's more difficult to do it. Uh, our current Secretary of Education plans on cutting 13% out of education budget and need will be losing some of those things that help them to do better. Kathy, do you know anything about what might be lost there? Um, I'm particularly concerned about Title II, and that's what funds basically our entire professional development, as well as some of our AGR teachers, right. um, our achievement, achievement gap reduction teachers. And that, look, I mean, the proposal for that is to completely eliminate those funds, which would eliminate about um, in addition to the 200,000 Matt was talking about for Medicaid billing, it would eliminate about 250,000 or 275,000 from the district for professional development and class size reduction. So I know this is complicated. And when election time comes, everybody's for good schools. But you have to look more closely at what they do. And the present Secretary of Education is out to take a lots of money and put it into voucher and school choice schools. That's going to take it away from our schools. Uh, you got to pay attention. You got to call our senator and say, "Don't do that. That hurts the schools right here in Wisconsin." I don't agree. What is it going to teach you, sir? You know, I know that you're all going home good teachers. I can give you a ton of stories about bad teachers. Vouchers, at least, would make you guys have to compete. There's no excuse. All you ever hear is positive things. Sorry, I know I'm not allowed to speak. No, I, those items aren't listed on the agenda. So yes. Legally, we can't. Discuss. Sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't. No, that's, that's fine. We, we hear your input. Um, I guess I'd like to maybe bring it back to the discussion about Vesper. Um, one of the things that came from the last meeting we had, which I was not aware of, was that there was room in Rudolph, I think, Academy for the entire Vesper school. And it got me thinking.
talking about my personal experience with my son, you know, we were, I don't want to say upset, but when Children's Choice closed, it was his last year and had to go to a new school. And I remember him coming home the first day, went to Washington. And I looked at him and I said, well, Nick, what'd you think? And he looked at me and said, wow, that school is huge. And then, you know, as, as my daughter grew up, we were in Washington almost every day and you think that school's not huge at all. But to a fifth grader coming from a smaller school, it was, but he loved Washington and we became a Washington family. We were involved with the parents group, and my hope is that we can do something like that here where all of you find people will become part of the Rudolph community, that that will be your new school, that you will take ownership in that, and your kids will be part of that school, if that's the decision we make. But I mean, that was the thought I had that night was that there's some possibilities here that we didn't know were here two or three months ago. The understanding at that time was there was not room at Rudolph for the entire student body, so we were going to have to split the kids up. And that was concerning to me because you establish friendships, you establish, you know, the kids you walk to school with every day, you walk down the hallway with them. And when you're split apart and you're going to different schools, it's hard to get that back. Kids make friends pretty easy, but still, I think it's a good option. I'd, I'd like to have some discussion about the, and I'm glad you're here, Roxanne, too. Yeah, could I ask Roxanne, could you clarify, because I, I don't recall exactly how you said if you, I know we talked about the not having to increase the number of teachers or anything in the class sizes and all that, the discussion there, was that if you were to absorb the entire um, VCA without, with the boundary exceptions and everything? Right, we would have to increase that thing, but when we were talking about total FTEs for the number of kids, it would, it would stay neutral. Um, so we wouldn't increase more than what would be if we counted best for and off together. How, Roxy, would you keep the uh, project-based learning that they value at Vester Alive at Rudolph? Some of our teachers, our veteran teachers, when we were at charter school, had attended um, project-based learning seminars, national seminars, and had some instruction in that. Um, there was a turnover of staff, and therefore, we had lost some of that project-based expertise with the staff that had left. We are now in the process, in fact, one of our building goals, our only building goal for next year is going back and exploring project-based learning and how we can bring it back into the school full force. There are teachers that are using portions of it, and we're looking at how we can become that again. At one point, one of our pillars when we were a charter school was we were a project-based learning school. Because I guess when I'm looking at the options as they're laid out in front of us, I thought initially moving the entire school into the pitch building probably made the most sense. But now we've got a school much closer. It's still a very manageable size. they got plenty of room. Boys and Girls Club is still in the pitch building. They've approached us about extending their lease for a period of time until their new building's completed. They wouldn't have that disruption in the pitch building. for a 
self-insured with a little bit of room for growth. Well, but I'm thinking um, our last um, capacity study put us at 235. And if we combine right now current DCA and current um, Rudolph, all students, um, reception included, we're at roughly 185. Now that's saying everyone will transfer, and we know that that's probably not going to happen. That would be accounting for everyone transferring. Um, and there's why well, I had given you at the board workshop the layout of the school and where the rooms are and things like that. There, there is room there for that. Um, what would happen is if, what we had spoke about this at the workshop also was that. Um, Anybody that's currently under a boundary exception, we would want to keep, and siblings of those students. But we might, let's say there's a new kindergartner coming in that would want a boundary exception, depending on size, if that's the first one of a family, we would probably have to say no, depending on where our numbers fell. But we don't want to say no to siblings of students that are currently coming, and that's taking a lot of this into consideration. Um, we, we want to keep families together, and not deny you know anybody possible but that's not you know that, that that's unrealistic to say that you could do that for everyone um so but looking at it um it, it could be done yes and i believe the boundary exception language as it's currently written is it's examined on a case-by-case -case basis Correct. on what room you have or don't have so i mean i'm sure now we've got students that are denied because we have classes are full so that would be the same there and if, if we were looking at option B there would that still include the bus that would go from mid school to that school uh yeah. i would say no and the reason okay. being those are the boundary exceptions those are boundary exceptions but what happens is that bus drops off at the middle school and it swings by me and it starts a route for vesper going out um we would have to redo our, our busing to bring the buses towards towards Rudolph, and so we wouldn't necessarily have a bus going the way it does now. Um, Are the bus but, companies doing the routing now, Dan? The bus companies doing the routing. Okay, have we taken a rough shot at what this could look like yet? Or we, we're just... still working on next year. Okay, so but I mean, just something to get an idea. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of concern from parents how long students' bus rides right. could be. The reason, the reason we did that uh, started that, that picking students up at need and taking, there was no cost to the district. Um, the bus bus was coming from the middle school, it just swung by me and then started its bus route. Picked those students up and then started its bus route uh, out to Vesper. Um, so there was no cost to the district at all in that and so that we agreed to do that. And that allowed parents that were interested in the project-based learning to access it if they dropped their student or caught the bus at need um, town. I don't know that we can do that. Well, we currently don't offer that service to any of our other schools. I mean, no. if, if you open an earlier student to a different school, you, you're responsible for transportation. So. Um, that doesn't mean that the parents couldn't take them. They were taking the best work time also. Mm -hmm. um, we thought it was a little more efficient. Uh, you know, one bus, a bus taking them out that's going out there anyway versus 15 cars or nine cars or whatever it was. But regardless of transportation, those students would be allowed I mean, yeah. you counted them in as part of your numbers. I did, yes. Were they bust them or they? Correct. I didn't take into consideration how they were bust. I just took the bodies and, and counted the bodies. Any more questions? How many students do we have that fall into that category right now? Or did us last year? Which, we, which category? That we went from me up to Vesper. Um, 16, I believe we said. 16. 16? 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. Before they close. Is there any more questions? Um, okay, specials. We have room for all of our specials rotation. Special, yes. Teachers? 
we have to see that it's a little bit of I mean, we'll maintain the same level of staffing that we have consistently throughout the district. Uh, we, the program used to be called SAGE. It was a started out 15 to 1 ratio. It went to 18. I believe it's at 20 now. Isn't well, it's it? 18, but we... Okay. But I mean, we that's always been the goal is to maintain that in K through 3, that we maintain that ratio of student to teacher. Because we think that's in the best interest of the kids. We'll still do that. It's not going to change anything. There's I mean, it's not a perfect 18 to 1 no. in any building, but no. we want to maintain a smaller mm -hmm. block size. Does the administration um, have any problems with this move that we are considering? Are any concerns, uh, Colleen? I'm not sure what you're asking. I mean, if we move them to Rudolph, including the, uh, those that are not residents of, of Vesper. Do you see any problems with doing that? In the, in the order that we're thinking about? This time administration brought these forward, so this is... Well, I'm asking. Yeah, I don't, at this time, I don't know if any of the directors or Jen or Roxanne do anything to have. I have seen our staff time and time and time and time again do more with less, and I know they're going to continue to do that. I really, really truly believe that. I guess I would like to ask Roxanne about the, the um, special education at Thanks. So the accommodations you'd shown us, that there was a, a pretty good size room there, it's big, it would be bigger than what you have now? or. The room that they would be moving in would right. be a little bit smaller in size. Um, a lot of the special ed students, I, I don't know about the special ed students what at the best part that you have right now as far as special ed. In special ed? Yeah. At Pink? Mm -hmm. um, Matt, want to help me out? Maybe uh, for next year, maybe eight. eight. I was going to guess six to eight for and next with, year. And with Vesper, what might you have? We have, we have 10 currently, um, three of them are fifth grade students that will be leaving, so we're in that six to eight area as well. And these are students that are mainly in the regular ed classroom that for next year. There are students, we, we don't have any students current. After this, this year, we won't have any students that um, aren't mainstream for most of the day. That's right. Right, there's, there's um, still out help, but it's... Teacher? What's that? There will be one teacher? No, I'm anticipating we'd work that out. I'm, I'm thinking there would be two special ed teachers for in, the numbers. In the one room, or two it, teachers in? It, well, we'd have to look at the schedules and see if there's room for two if we need to. It depends on if the students are self-contained, right. if they're okay. what we need for room. I didn't look any further into it because I didn't know which direction the board was going to go. Okay. Okay, that could change in any school right. any year. Right. So, right. Yeah. I just don't want it to be very... And oftentimes the special ed teacher will be in the regular classroom right. with the regular ed teacher. Right. If there's a significantly high need student or a higher population of special ed teachers, so they're teaming together, which is really the optimal situation if we can make that happen rather than pulling the kids out. But often we need to pull them out as well. Yeah, I think it, um, like uh, Colin was saying, that there's a lot of things that, that we look at the specific needs of the student, uh, the students at the beginning um, in January and February, looking at staffing needs for the for the following year. So it's, it, it's quite early to, to, to determine staffing, but uh, I think we will we'll be able, to, we, have, we have outstanding teachers at both schools and we'll be able to, and, and, and uh, aid staff as well, so we'll be able to, to work something out um, that we need to move to the special education students. Are there any other questions? I want to make a motion um, to move Think Academy uh, let's see, to close Vesper, to move the Vesper students to Think Academy, and to combine Think and VCA at Rudolph, adding all current VCA students, including boundary exception students. Yeah. 
to both think and VCA for the 2017-18 school year? The end. The end. The end. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. I so the, that. the boundary exceptions would be included. Everyone. Everyone. Good. Okay, we have a motion and a second to close the Vesper Community Academy and combine Think and VCA at Rudolph, adding all current VCA students, including boundary exception students, to both Think and VCA at the end of the 2017-18 school year. We have roll call, please. Mr. Bumble? Yes. Mrs. Rail? Yes. Mrs. Hett? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mr. Crings? Yes. And I would ask all of your parents to please get involved with Rudolph. They need parents involved with their parents group to be in the classroom to help out the same as every other school, the same as best school does. That will be your children's new school. Make it yours. Okay, and before um, we finish, take a look at the calendar on the June 26th meeting just to confirm who all will be able to attend a special budget meeting, budget hearing. Um, we didn't hear from Katie or Ann, so the other five members for sure are able to make it, and you're gone, right? I don't, yeah, I think okay. I'll be gone by then. But Larry, John, I want to make that? Okay. And just note that the July 3rd committee meeting is moved to July 5th at the same time. That way, if anybody can get to the 4th of July week, then I won't have to come back to that meeting. That's it, we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone.